Hello and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. And today I'm doing this video in answer to a request from viewer Saxon4625, uh, who asked if I could talk about Josef Hoffmann. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't actually get to talking about the Ballad in F minor. There were some other pieces that I was uh, more interested in talking about, but hopefully this will still be interesting to you. Uh, Hoffman is someone who I didn't actually listen to very much when I was uh, growing up as a teenager and really getting into piano playing. Uh, there were a few recordings that I really connected with, but uh, many of the others I found to be kind of uh, off-putting. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So many of these recordings I'm actually just getting to know now, and I'm finding myself fascinated anew by just the individuality of Hoffman's style. There's not very many pianists of uh, any time, whether from the early part of the 20th century or now, where you could tell exactly who is playing within moments of, of hearing a recording. Uh, but Hoffman is definitely one of those. He had such a distinctive approach to the piano and very distinctive sound effects that he made use of that his fingerprint is just indelible. So even when I don't necessarily agree with what he's doing or I don't particularly like the exact effects, it's still fascinating and very inspiring. And Hoffman rightly should be considered a pretty legendary figure, uh, primarily because he is the closest direct link that we have on record to the artistry of Anton Rubinstein. Uh, Anton Rubinstein should not be confused with the nowadays more famous Arthur Rubinstein, the great Polish pianist. Uh, Anton Rubinstein was a Russian virtuosi of the 19th century, uh, one of the greatest pianists of all time, apparently, and a highly regarded composer in his day. Uh, he was a younger contemporary of Franz Liszt and knew him well. They had various ups and downs in their friendship, but Liszt always really admired Rubinstein as a titanic musician and pianist. Uh, Rubinstein was sometimes called Ludwig II because of the passion of his piano playing, the inspiration of his improvisations, and maybe also because he had a passing resemblance to old Ludwig van Beethoven. Hoffman studied one-on-one -on -one with Rubinstein for a couple of years, from 1892 to 1894, approximately when Hoffman was uh, 16 to 18 or so. And he was very lucky to do so. Rubinstein had no other pupils at that time. And Hoffman recorded his memories with Anton Rubinstein. And they make fascinating reading, uh, absolutely required if you are a wannabe classical pianist. Uh, you can find them in this volume, uh, very handily available for cheap from Dover Publications, and it contains lots of very interesting insights in addition to Hoffman's memories of Rubinstein about his general musical approach and his philosophy. It's well worth checking out. Uh, I put a link to the Project Gutenberg version of the book as well, so you, you can actually read it for free online, although supporting the publishing house would probably be a nice thing to do. Hoffman was also a trendsetter in his scientific interests. Uh, he was an inventor, actually. He had over 70 patents by the end of his life, including one for windshield wipers, things that help with uh, suspension in vehicles and cars, uh, and various improvements to piano sound and the recording of piano sound and uh, advancements in piano action that Steinway made use of. But in addition to all that, he was one of the very first pianists of note to record. He may even have been the first. It's a little difficult to always date those things, but... Thomas Edison recorded him on a wax cylinder in 1888. So if you think about that, that was only a couple of years after Liszt had died. And from 1902 on, he recorded quite prolifically uh, in the early acoustic process. And these early discs are really wonderful in their way, oftentimes. The level of technical perfection is astonishing. Uh, even nowadays, with all the advancements that have been made in the technical side of playing the piano, there's not many pianists who could boast such ease and rapidity and clarity in the very most difficult passages. There's any number of recordings I could pick to showcase this, but one of the recordings that I think shows him to his best possible advantage, and one of my favorites, is his abridged recording of the Tarantella from Liszt's Venezia in Napoli Suite.
So that's really astonishing. I, I don't think I've ever heard a recording that surpasses the difficulties with such elan and ease. And more importantly, it just has such a sense of fun to it, like he's really just having a ball playing this music. Now, my favorite of all these early acoustic recordings is a rarity, and it's a more lyrical selection, as you might expect from me. I tend to really like the lyrical pieces. Uh, it's a recording of one of Chopin's songs in Liszt's arrangement, uh, Moja Pieszotka. I hope I said that correctly. Please go easy on me. I'm not Polish. Uh, it's usually translated as My Joys, I believe, but I guess a closer translation would be something like My Enchantress. Uh, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's any Polish speakers out there, but I, th I think that's about it. At any rate, Hoffman gives an enchanting performance of this piece, and of course, a very idiosyncratic one. So you'll hear very, very subtle quality of rubato, uh, both of the hands not lining up kind, and also in the hesitating and pushing forward to in tempo kind of rubato. It's very tasteful, very subtle, but it gives the music this wonderful kind of breezy, improvised quality. Uh, this recording also showcases Hoffman's almost supernatural ability with extraordinarily rapid, pearly, non-legato runs. It's quite incredible, and it was a hallmark of his playing. I've never heard any other pianist who uses this touch so frequently, and also so successfully. It uh, can throw me off a little bit in certain of his recordings. It, it can come off a little bit flippant or disconnected from the musical meaning. But here, I think it really works in this uh, Chopin song. It's kind of a little bit slyly humorous, and it, it, it really uh, is irresistible. So I'm going to play this entire recording for you with my notes uh, written on the score. Uh, I think this is one of the most instructive old recordings I've ever heard, one of the very best. So I think everyone should study this recording and learn from it whatever they can.
So just beautiful. And it's really when I hear recordings like that, I fully understand why Rachmaninoff referred to Hoffman as the greatest living pianist. And that's the very high praise indeed. I mean, Rachmaninoff is probably my pick for the greatest pianist on record that uh, we have to the present day. But he was certainly not easy to please. Interestingly, though, there were at least a few pianists at the time who didn't share this opinion. Uh, notably, Arthur Rubinstein, the Polish pianist, uh, Vladimir Horowitz, Rachmaninoff's friend, and also Claudio Arau. So why was this? Why didn't they really care for Hoffman's playing? Uh, well, we should set aside possible professional jealousy. I mean, that, that's always uh, on the table, especially for a Rubinstein. But uh, let's just consider exactly what they said, because separately, they all pretty much agreed in their statements on Hoffman's playing. Uh, they all highlighted Hoffman's incredible technical facility at the piano. Uh, Rubinstein actually met Hoffman, and he wrote about him in his the first volume of his memoirs. And uh, he said that when Rubinstein played for Hoffman, he seemed pretty apathetic and didn't really seem interested in talking about music or talking about uh, Rubinstein's playing or his own playing or anything like that. But when they were about to leave, Hoffman, in kind of a childishly proud way, wanted to show him all of his inventions and all the little scientific gadgets that he was working on at the time. Uh, but he also spoke about being kind of unsettled by Hoffman's occasional tendency when he when he heard him in later years to produce this kind of sudden shocking roar of sound in his left hand uh, out of nowhere. Uh, this was another aspect of Hoffman's style, which is very recognizable in his later recordings, which we're going to get to in a little bit. Uh, Horowitz was more offhand. He basically said, oh, well, he was an amazing technician, but not much of a musician. It was pretty, pretty common for Horowitz to give those little one-liner slapdowns. Uh, Arau, on the other hand, had some very carefully thought out criticism of both Hoffman and also his student uh, Shura Tcherkovsky. Basically, he felt that it was too contrived and that many of the details that he would bring out, like uh, inner voices and the texture, were not motivated by the inner spirit of the music, but were kind of just selected at random to draw attention. And I believe he also seconded the notion that there were these kind of odd extremes in Hoffman's live performances. So we have these two issues. One, maybe a slightly detached feeling, and two, the complete opposite kind of extremes of passion and maybe bombast. So the second issue never comes out in Hoffman's studio recordings. They're always very classical, very restrained, but occasionally you can hear a kind of detachment or a mechanical quality. So let's hear a little bit of Hoffman's acoustic recording of Chopin's Bursus. Uh, here's the opening first. That's, to me, he plays the opening in an oddly detached and even flat kind of way. It's curious how distant he sounds from the character of the music. Uh, let's hear a spot a little later on in the piece. This is incredible from a technical standpoint, incredibly difficult to play this passage so clearly at such a speed. But again, it gives the music more of a virtuoso feeling rather than really that kind of dreamy, bursus like character that you would expect. So this is subjective on my part. I, I don't care for this recording as much as the others. And I think that maybe it was playing like this that might have turned these other three great pianists off of Hoffman at times. Of course, not everyone can be on all the time, and perhaps that was just Hoffman's uh, little difficulty. You know, he, he had no technical uh, problems to deal with, and maybe it was difficult to always feel totally invested in the music. He, he was capable of just kind of tossing it off when he wanted to. And then there's the issue of unpredictable extremes, mentioned by Rubinstein and Arau. We haven't heard this yet, 
And uh, you'll only really hear this in his live recordings from later in his career. We don't have any live recordings from earlier on, so I don't know if this was a quality that was ever present or if it really only took shape later in, in, the, in the 30s and 40s. But in some of these later recordings, we get a very different personality emerging from what we've heard so far. So let's hear something a little different here. This is from Hoffman's 1937 Golden Jubilee concert. It's the climactic passage, one of the climactic passages from Chopin's G minor ballade. So hopefully uh, it was fairly obvious to you, especially if you've heard the piece before, um, how unusual this is, a very different approach. All the same qualities of sound are present. You know, he has, he has a wonderful, that wonderful golden sound and, and a rich tone quality, but he is playing with these extremes of speed and also these kind of explosions of sound. I, I kind of cheekily marked, there were like a nine or 10 bombs that he dropped in the left hand that are not written in the score at all. And... I mean, it's up to you to decide, is this is this great, is this exciting, or is it kind of crass? One thing for sure, it's kind of odd coming from Hoffman, uh, because if you read that uh, book that I recommended earlier, which he, of course he wrote many years before, he said some, some things that were uh, kind of at odds with this, like a purposed, blatant parading of the player's dear self through willful additions of nuances, shadings, effects, and whatnot, is tantamount to a falsification. At best, it is playing to the galleries, charlatanism. The player should always feel convinced that he plays only what is written. So something led Hoffman in a very different direction in his later years. Definitely, he's not practicing what he preaches in, in a performance like this. And of course, it's understandable. When you get in front of an audience, the pressure can really be extreme to deliver. And the desire to create excitement and really affect the audience can overwhelm all your better instincts. And if we consider all the other pressures that Hoffman dealt with in his very busy life, maybe it isn't surprising that there was this high-strung quality to much of his playing, especially in the 30s and 40s. Uh, besides all of his tinkering and inventing, Hoffman was also a founding faculty member at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, and he became director of the school in 1927. And over the next 10 or 11 years, he poured a huge amount of his intellect and energy into making that school one of the greatest conservatories in the world, which of course it still is to this day. Uh, there was a very painful and complex series of events involving a lot of backstabbing and conspiring that led to Hoffman leaving the school in 1938. And at this time, he was already struggling with alcoholism and difficulties in his, in his family life. So his playing became much spottier until his retirement in the late 40s. And he never got around to recording the vast majority of his repertoire in the new uh, electrical method of recording as, as he had planned. So here's another example of some more erratic playing on his part. This is from the same concert. It's Chopin's famous E-flat major nocturne. And uh, amidst some really gorgeous and tasteful playing, there's this strangely jerky, impulsive moment. See if you can spot it.
So moments like that really do kind of make me scratch my head and kind of like what's going on there. Uh, to me, they don't seem to really fit in, into the music. But, but again, you might just find them to be very inspired and kind of unusual. And don't get me wrong, it's not like he was totally in a decline at this point. He was still a very strong player and really could make magic happen. And it's really up to you to decide, you know, is it erratic or is it inspiring and exciting? Uh, personally, I think it's both. And everyone's going to find these recordings to be a little bit different. But they're definitely worth listening to because Hoffman opens up many potentials of piano sound that you don't hear in many other artists. So it's if you're a pianist, it's definitely worth taking a listen to. Uh, Hoffman was still quite capable at that time of playing in his more classical style that we heard in his acoustic recordings. Uh, there's a small collection of pieces that he recorded in the studio in the 30s in the new technology, including a wonderful rendition of the B minor Chopin Sonata, first movement. And this is him at his most Apollonian, uh, but also very inspired. Another personal favorite of mine from this period, which is probably one of my favorite recordings ever, is the second movement of Chopin's E minor piano concerto. This is with John Barbaroli and the New York Phil in the late 30s. And this is kind of an odd situation where I would never do anything in this concerto the way that Hoffman does it, but at the same time, I'm just totally spellbound and I love hearing what he comes up with. Again, it's so unique. You'll never hear anyone else play this piece in quite the same way, uh, nor should you. It would, it would probably just end up being a caricature if you tried to copy it. Bye. 
So this was Hoffman really on form, and that must have been what Rachmaninoff meant when he said at around that time that, quote, Hoffman is still sky high, the greatest pianist alive if he is sober and in form. Otherwise, it is impossible to recognize the Hoffman of old. So even when he was off form, though, it's, his playing is always brilliant, always daring, always full of ideas and imagination. So take it for what it is, I guess. So thank you for watching this little talk about Josef Hoffman. And please do comment below. I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say about my take on it or any of these pieces that I've talked about. I know that there's a lot of division among people who hear Hoffman. If you go through the comment sections of YouTube videos, you'll find that uh, many people absolutely worship him. Some people just absolutely hate everything that he does. So uh, please do comment and let me know which side you fall on. And most importantly, why you fall on one side or the other. Uh, also, please support the channel. Uh, you can do that by just hitting the like button and the subscribe button. Or you can also support me financially at www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. Uh, please also stay tuned next week. I'll be back here with some more discussion, some more great music. So until then, please take care and keep practicing. <laughs>